in my experience, when I was in the church in recent years, it seemed like that edge of like, you just can't divorce. Like you, God just hates it so much that that had dissipated. But that when I was a kid, that was a really big deal. Like it was almost like a described, I remember in sermons, they talk about generational curses. And like, if your great grandparents got divorced and your great grandparents, and now your parents got divorced, here you are the child of three generations, like stop the generational curse stay in your marriage no matter what god will make a way he'll show you know grace and power and show up big and there was never this exception of like but maybe there are good reasons for divorce it was just god hates it blanket statement god hates it so don't do it and it's 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 so sad to think about the people that felt like if you don't if you if you don't stay you're completely dishonoring god and you're completely like he said walking away from your relationship with him is like such a such an insensitive and horrible prison for people in especially in hyper abusive cases was a pastor. He was a, a Dr. Ron Sauer. He was a professor at Moody and he was doing uh, temporary pastor work uh, down the street, you know, from where we lived. And he came to my parents' house to talk to me and he brought his wife. He said, I talked on the phone, you know, with your husband and he's sorry you know, he hasn't been, and I told him he hasn't been the best husband and he needs to be better. I said, I'm not going back. He said, if you leave, if you divorce him, you're severing your relationship with God is what he told me. Mm. And I just was like, open mouth. I'm like, what? I said, well, according to the Bible, isn't it cheating? Because he has all these porn stuff. And I, you know, I talked about that and his wife said to him, you know, she's got a point, Ron. And he chastised her in front of me. And so instantly I had a connection with her and I knew that he was being the kind of husband that, you know, mine was to me. Wow. He, he wouldn't stop being how he was that I was severing my relationship. So I told him you have to leave. So I kicked them out of the house, but I hugged his wife before they left because I just, I felt bad for her because I felt like he was that kind of abusive um, possessive husband. It's interesting that that messaging, I think, was more prevalent back then. I mean, I, I could be wrong. I'm, I'm not in the church anywhere near as much these days. Obviously, I'm farther from their messaging. But in my experience, when I was in the church in recent years, it seemed like that edge of like, you just can't divorce. Like, you, God just hates it so much that that had dissipated. But that when I was a kid, that was a really big deal. Like, it was almost like a described i remember in sermons they talk about generational curses and like if your great grandparents got divorced and your great grandparents and now your parents got divorced here you are the child of three generations like stop the generational curse stay in your marriage no matter what god will make a way he'll show you know grace and power and show up big and there was never this exception of like but maybe there are good reasons for divorce it was just god hates it blanket statement god hates it so don't do it and it's 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 so sad to think about the people that felt like if you don't if you if you don't stay, you're completely dishonoring God, and you're completely like he said, walking away from your relationship with him is like such a such an insensitive and horrible prison for people in especially in hyper abusive cases. Welcome again, and thank you for being here. So I'm going to talk about a few things in this video, and one of the main things that. I mean, a lot of us, we, there's so many different doctrines. There's so many different doctrines about this um, thing called divorce and marriage and separation and all of these things. And one of the things that has actually crept into the church is the divorce, remarriage, divorce, remarriage. Yes, God hates divorce. And God, he is the author of marriage. So he 
he has the right to tell us how marriage should work. Marriage is one woman, one man for life. Anything else that you try to call marriage, I mean, you can try to, you can't get to redefine what God calls marriage, but people make it seem as though God is so wicked that no matter what's going on in a marriage, a woman is supposed to stay and she's supposed to stay and get banged into and, and, and get raped and get uh, ill-treated and all of these different things. But that's not what he says in 1 Corinthians uh, verse 7. Well, in this in First Corinthians chapter seven, verse um, verse ten and eleven, verses ten and eleven, it says, "But unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But and if she departs, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband." So God does understand that there might be a situation where this wife might have to depart. There might be something, because we are sinful human beings, something might come up where this woman might have to run for her life. The Bible doesn't say you have to stay there and risk your life or risk your children's lives and things like that. So some people make it seem as though God is this. People make it seem as though God is unreasonable and he does not um, care about how you live or what is the quality of your life. He does say that, yes, you should remain married, you should remain together, but if you have to depart, if you have to depart, which means that, hey, there might be a reason that you may leave. There may be a reason, there might be something. We are human beings, we are sinful human beings. So even though he hates divorce, he hates divorce, yes, but he does accept that there might be a reason why someone may have to leave, but he says, but if you leave, you ought to remain unmarried or reconcile to your spouse. Marriage is something that God created. He ordained. He reserves 100% of the rights to say what it should be and what it is not. No one can come and reconstruct marriage and determine, well, two men together, that's marriage. Two women together, that's marriage. Marrying an animal, that's a marriage. No, you, you, you can call that whatever you want to call it, but you can't call it marriage because you can't redefine what God created to be marriage. And now she was told that if she, if she leaves her husband, that she would be ending her relationship with God, which is truly, I mean, it's clearly not biblical. It's clearly not biblical. But the very Bible says if she leaves, she has to remain single. It doesn't mean, it, is, it does not say if she leaves, she ends her relationship with God. So everyone has a doctrine that they like to spill out there to keep people believing all sorts. But if you don't, you see, if you don't search the scriptures for yourself, you will end up believing every and anything. That same timeline, I started, I went back to school at 46 for occupational therapy. I started having a crush on one of my teachers, you know, one of my straight female teachers. I'm like, what is going on? Like I had had dreams in the past about women and, and there was things, but I like I had said before, I just pushed everything down. So it was um it it was becoming obvious and I, you know, I wasn't stalking her or any, anything like that, but it was just obvious. It was like, you know, it was just like like a teenager and it was it was crazy. I um I had shared it with my son. We were um living in a house in Ham and I'm in the basement and I'm like, David, I have to tell you something. And I told him the, you know, the attraction for women. And he's like, what, what are you talking about? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I, I just, you know, this is just, I'm sharing with you what's going on inside of me. At the same time, my, my uh, youngest son came in the house and we could hear him upstairs. And uh, my son shouts out and he says, Daniel, get down here. We have a situation. <laughs> Because it's like they didn't know what to do. There was no signs that I had been, you know, leaning towards, you know, being a lesbian or anything. So he came down. We talked, and and I was glad that it, that this time, you know, the relationship with my kids that I could talk to him about things like this. I'm more of a progressive Christian because I'm like, how is this wrong? I mean, I am still a Christian. I believe in God. I love Jesus, but this is something a part of me. How is that wrong? I mean, didn't he make me this way? This is one of the things that 
people struggle with so much. Like, you know what? God made me like this. So I can be like this and I could still say I'm praising God. I can be like this and I could still say I'm worshiping God. But then you need to decide which God, because there are many gods in this world. There are many gods in this world. So yes, if you want to pervert what he has created, what he has meant to be in a, you know, he, he, he's meant one man to one woman. If you want to now come and pervert that to go woman to woman and man to man, that's perversion. That's what the devil likes. The devil likes perversion, inversion, twist it, turn it upside down, turn it where it's, you know, do things that God hates. So God hates when he, we, we do things that are contrary to how he ordained it to be. Things that are counterproductive because two men cannot produce, two women cannot produce the devil. I mean, if we only could see how much this is, a, a, this is an assault on humanity because one of the, the, the agendas of the enemy is to lower the number of humans on the earth. And, you know, the way he has succeeded in us self-sabotaging, it's really incredible. It's mind-boggling to see how he has succeeded in having us sabotage our own lives, our own human race. We are self-sabotaging and we are embracing that doctrine of love is love, believing that it's for our good. And it's because, you know what, this, do you know how spiritual this is? Do you know that these are demons that are released onto the earth because man has said it's okay? Man has said it's okay, so now these demons are legal to now come and infiltrate people's minds and confuse even the children about who they really are. Imagine we have to discuss in 2024, what is a man? What is a woman? Can a man menstruate? Can a, 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 a man have a, a baby? Can a man give birth? Imagine we have to discuss that in 2024. And these are the same people who like to come and tell us about science. Really? Once I started to read the Bible without those, you know, rose colored indoctrination glasses, I started to realize how toxic and narcissistic that God is portrayed. And I'm like, how could me be a better parent than God? But if my child did anything, no matter what they did, I would never want their eternal conscious torment. I would never want them to be tormented forever. Never. That made me a better parent than God because because of a lack of belief, these people are going to hell. So that was the other thing that I couldn't. He, he's all love and all good, but yet he's sending people to hell for a lack of belief, not even because they, they're horrible people. Because you can be a horrible person, say the, the sinner's prayer, and then guess what? You get to go to heaven. You know, it was like this realizing that the vertical morality was about obedience to God, and it wasn't about being a good person. And one of the other things that you see time and time again is where people like to believe that they can compare themselves to the Most High God, where they believe that they can say, but you know what, if I'm a good parent, then I would never do such a thing to my child. How could God be a good God? How could he be a loving God if he can punish someone for eternity? You are trying to put yourself on the same level as the creator of everything. You who created nothing without using what he first created. You who don't even know how many years you have on the earth. You who don't even know how he created the things he created. You want to put yourself on the same level as God and say, well, if I don't do this this way, why should God? How could we say that he's loving if he does it this way? While me, isn't that how the devil operates? Me, I, I wouldn't do it like that. You want to oppose the most high God? You want to go head on with the creator of everything? Should I, um, I kind of alluded to before, but the, the afterlife, how did, how have you dealt with that? Are you, have you concluded that you probably don't go anywhere when you die and are you okay with that or how are you thinking through that issue? That's a process. I, um, I'm open to there being something I kind of want there to be. I feel like there's an interconnectedness with humans. Maybe there's something the universe provides after, maybe reincarnation. I don't know. I'm still 
relatively new, so I'm I'm still searching. I don't I don't know for sure, um, but I know that this life is not a throwaway. So I know it's important how you live now. So regardless of what it will be, I don't have to know. Yeah. No, Agreed. I'm still, you know, it, it will be what it'll be. I don't know. I don't know. You know, I don't have those answers, but I'm open to learning and accepting. This is one of the things that people, I mean, I think you, when you decide that you want to be an atheist and you decide that you, you don't want to have anything to do with God, you have to block out that afterlife aspect you have to be like uh i don't know what it is i i i mean it's okay to not know I, when i get there i'll see hmm. we don't even do that for stuff where you know where you could reverse it so for example you don't go to the airport and say you know what i don't know if my passport is in my bag but when i get there i'm gonna see you make sure that's something you can i mean even if you don't have your passport, you can still change the dates on your ticket. If, if, if it's too late, you can go run back and get your passport if you have enough time. But you want to take a chance with something as final as eternity. Something as final as eternity, where when you cross through that door of death, you do not get to come back and say, ah, I changed my mind. You want to take a chance and say, well, it's okay not to know. When I get there, I'll see. You don't do that for anything else, but you want to take that chance for something that's final and irreversible. It's the most horrendous mistake any soul can make. Beside that, when I get there, I'll see. So what if you see something you, you didn't expect? What if you get there and you realize this hell that everyone has been talking about, that the Bible tells us is real, that Jesus spoke about more than he spoke about heaven, this hell, this, this raging, fiery hell is real. What do you, what do, you do when you, you realize that? Hmm? What do you do when you get there? You, you're not wearing this bodysuit anymore, so you can't come back and change your mind. What do you do when you get there and you realize that hell is real? What do you do when you get to the afterlife and you realize that hell is real? What, tell me what is the plan? What is the plan? When you realize that hell is real, what is the plan? What is the plan? You see how the devil makes people not even think clearly? When I get there, I'll see. When you get there, you'll see. Or oh, definitely, when you get there, you will see. Oh, there's some down there, and I never thought about it. <clears throat> they say they don't sin. They said, I don't, <clears throat> I'm not a sinner. And I'm like, yeah. I don't sin because that's a, that's a, that's a religious concept. Sin. I don't sin. I just, I don't try to harm other fellow human beings and that's it. I try to be the best person I can and that's all any of us can do. So yeah. I'm okay with that. You know? Mm. So. This is how the devil keeps you going in lies. One lie after the next, one lie after the next. I don't sin. I don't sin. First John 1, 8. If we say that we, have no sin, we make him out to be a liar because all have sinned, all have sinned. But this, you see, when you decide to give away to Satan, when you decide to give him a, lend him your air, you can whisper all the lies because guess what? There's no end of lies with Satan. He fathers lies. He's the father of lies. So now here he's telling you, I, I don't sin. That's a religious concept sin. I don't sin. I don't sin. Jesus died for nothing because I don't sin. <laughs> How we deceive ourselves when we listen to the enemy of our souls. You shake hands with the one who's taken you down to the pits of hell, while the one who laid out his life on that cross so that you can have eternal life. You turn your back on him. You say he's a narcissist and he's a this and he's a psycho, a psycho, um, you know, all these different words and terms that you use to to speak about the Most High God. These words are being recorded next to your name in the courts of heaven. You see, your name is not cleared because you did not want the blood of Jesus to blot out your sin. So your name is not cleared in the courts of heaven. Those, everything is documented. You think, it's the, you think this is a joke? You think this is um, some, some sort of fictitious book where you know, the Bible is not real, the devil is not real, the afterlife is not real. So you can just determine 
I'll see when I get there. It's okay. Every single word, you will have to give an account. Because the blood of Jesus is being blotted out for you simply because you refused. So now you go, you, you go before the Most High God, staying with sin and all the evil things that you said about him. And you expect him to say, well done, welcome. You go against what he created to be a natural Create, what he created to be natural, man and woman. You go against that and you come before him as a dead person into eternity and expect that he would say to you, well done. No, 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 no. There is judgment. There is a fiery judgment awaiting those who turn their backs on the only salvation, the only way, the only way. He's made a way. He's made provisions because you know what? God knows that he did not create our souls for hell. Human souls were not created for that place. And look how merciful God is. In our day and age, we have so many countless testimonies of people talking about hell and their experience in hell. And no one is telling you that it was great. It was awesome. Oh, I had a great time in hell. Oh, it was so good. I can't wait to go back. Nobody is saying that. But here you are. You will still say, I'll wait and see. I'll wait and see. I am pleading with souls because I know that time is short and that those who die apart from receiving that salvation, that, that blood that covers your sin, will be extremely regretful, not just for a moment, but for eternity. The afterlife is real. You are a soul. You have a spirit. You are in a body. You are not just this body. And there is an afterlife to come waiting for every single human being at the end of your life. When it's finished for you here, it starts for you over there. I'm pleading with you, do your due diligence when it comes to your soul. Do not listen to, to voices that will take you astray. Because when you cross over into eternity, there is absolutely no coming back to say, I am doing it over now. I see, I've seen what is over there. I've changed my mind. You want to fight with Satan? You will go where Satan goes. But God is not happy that anyone would perish. He's not, he does not delight in that. He has given us a chance and he's giving you time to change your mind. And many people have crossed over into that eternity and uh, now they wish they could come back and change their minds, but it is too late. Don't wait till you get there to decide, finally, I've changed my mind, because you're not going to be able to come back. You're not ever coming back here. Choose life. I'm pleading with souls. Choose life. Thank you for being here. Until next.